Happy Earth Day, everyone. Um, we're very pleased to host today one of the Crusaders for Conservation, Dr. Lori Marker. Um, she's the founder and executive director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund, and she brings over 30 years of experience to the race to save the cheetah. Um, Dr. Marker has implemented a variety of conservation efforts in Namibia, ranging from livestock guarding dog programs to um, bush block to save the prey. Um, Dr. Marker is also going to talk a little bit about her latest book, which was published just yesterday, um, A Future for Cheetahs. Um, it's a large format book chronicling cheetahs in the wild, and it features photography by Susie Esterhaas. And so we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but without further um, ado, please join me in welcoming Lori to Google. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here, and Earth Day especially. This is like the 44th year of Earth Day. Anyone remember the first one? <laughs> yeah, I know, I do too, but that's good. Um, I was then also on a Google Hangout today, which was kind of neat, talking about kind of the two polar opposites, the polar bears and the cheetah, both iconic species, and both uh, most people don't realize how climate change is affecting animals like the cheetah, but we were talking about climate change as well. And for cheetahs, it's all about living in harmony with them in Africa. So we um, have to figure out how to live and flourish with cheetahs. Everyone knows that the cheetah is the fastest land animal, and we do have a cheetah that you're going to meet here a little bit later. But just to talk about it, you'll see it as it's walking, and I want you to just think a bit about how special they are. But they're aerodynamic and built for speed. Today, the world's about speed. However, there's nothing that can equal a cheetah. And uh, it's on the Earth. There are only about 10,000 of them left. So they are very special. But they're the most specialized of all the 37 species of cats. So we'll talk more about the cheetah when it comes out a little bit later. But we'll talk a little bit about you know, being an icon of speed. Because they're so beautiful. And if we lose them, the pronghorn antelope becomes the next fastest land animal. Although it's beautiful as well, it's got not quite the same iconic uh, vision as that of the cheetah, fast like a pronghorn. Well, the, cheetah, the pronghorn's fast because the cheetah actually used to live in North America, and predators and play, prey play a very key role living together. And we always talk about cheetahs as being a very important part of ecosystems. Ecosystems keep us all alive, and predators are something that we think around the world should actually go away. And most of our predators are vulnerable to, um, to extinction today because of the way we view them. However, when we have top predators, we have a healthier ecosystem with more biodiversities. And cheetahs play a very key role in this in the grassland ecosystems. With only about 10,000 cheetahs remaining in the world, what's happened to them? We've lost approximately 90% of our cheetahs in the last 100 years. The area on this map here that is darker brown is the area where cheetahs are found today. So they're living in very small numbers, fragmented through a continent that is huge. In the last 50 years, we've lost about 16 um, countries where cheetahs are living. The cheetah was found in India and became extinct in the 50s. In the Middle East in the 70s, the last of the Asian cheetahs is found in Iran, where there are only about 60 cheetahs. Cheetahs are an animal that don't do well in protected game reserves. So although we think of Africa as being a very large continent with lots of, lots of wildlife, they don't do well because lions and hyenas steal their food and kill their young and push them out of these systems that are not very large but that's where they are the kings of the game reserves. And so cheetahs get pushed out. They're in conflict with humans and livestock. And throughout Africa, we've got human populations that are growing. And most people are living in sub-Saharan Africa, have lots and lots of livestock. And the poor rural livestock farmers often don't take very good care of their animals. And if a cheetah or other predators catch a, um, one of the livestock, then they're oftentimes killed. So that's the issues that we're actually facing. So these pictures here show a bit about what that looks like. Up in the very top on your right is actually cubs. And we've got a very bad illegal trade going on 
today in northern Africa going into the Middle East for the pet trade. I live in Namibia. Namibia is a uh, democratic country. It's about two and a half times the size of California. Very, very arid where we're very prone to drought cycles. And with this, um, it's now the last large habitat for cheetahs. We have about three to 4,000 of the remaining 10,000 cheetahs. We've doubled that population in the 25 years that I've set up the Cheetah Conservation Fund. And our vision is really to see a world in which cheetahs live in harmony and uh, co flourish in coexistence with people and the environment. And that's, I think, a big thing today is that we have forgotten how to coexist. And the cheetah doesn't live inside of a square box of a game reserve. It's made me think for about 40 years about how to save them, and that's outside square boxes. And I've had to look at a world-changing things. And it's interesting, how does one actually go about changing the world? Google has changed the world. The cheetah is changing the world as well. Now, over a 40-year period of time, I thought, well, I know a lot about cheetahs, and I've studied them. I know, you know more about them than probably most anybody knows about any living species. And yet with this, just knowing about them is not going to save them. So I set out about 25 years ago and moved to Namibia, a country that I traveled to a lot, to try to find out why people were killing cheetahs. When I got to Namibia, farmers were killing about 1,000 cheetahs a year. It was indiscriminate. They saw a cheetah. It was a perceived threat to their livestock. They would catch them in capture cages. And once caught, they would usually shoot them. But why? Was it because they were causing a problem to their livestock? We primarily found that it was because they were perceived as vermin. And that's the same thing that we as globally think of all of our predators. So I think this is probably something that it's not just our African farmers, but it's farmers worldwide, that the value of wildlife, the value of predators are really limited. Farmers, ranchers, the world really looks at our livestock. But where do wildlife fit in? What is the value of conservation? Our research and our, our, our um, cheetah conservation fund really deals with the cheetah survival and we're a research-based conservation program. So we learn about the animal, we do conservation, and we do a lot of education. The cheetah is an animal that is very unique. It lacks genetic diversity. And genetic diversity keeps us all healthy. And um, the diversity of our genes is very important. But the cheetah actually went through a population bottleneck about 10 to 12,000 years ago, leaving them very, very um, very genetically the same. So there's a whole aspect of biology that we need to understand, basic biology. Um, so we study the cheetah in that aspect. We also then look at how to stop farmers from catching cheetahs, stopping the human-wildlife conflict, which has become a model for predators and people living together around the world, and then looking at livelihoods. Because if you're a poor, starving farmer, um, you really don't want to have cheetahs or other predators coming in. And I always like to ask people, how many people really would like to be a poor, starving farmer in an arid type area in Africa? Anybody? Usually I find nobody. <laughs> and I um, live as a farmer in Namibia, because when I moved there, it was actually to find out how to live in harmony with the people. We have a very large research area, and we do a lot of work using Google Maps and using GIS. And we study maps everywhere. So maps are a very big part of our life. This is just a little map with a bunch of dots on it that says, the red dots were where we went and rescued cheetahs. The black dots are when I went door to door and talked to farmers to find out everything there was about their ecosystem. And that area that's in there is about the size of California. This area that's pulled off to the side is our research area. And all those other dots that are over there are where we use radio telemetry. And we now use satellite collars. So every little dot that's there is where we know a cheetah has gone. And then we go out into those areas and we understand more about how it overlaps with the farms 
and the farmers and where the wildlife is and understand why the cheetah went to those dots. Our biomedical is world renowned for the work that we do. And I just want to put this in perspective. We're in the middle of nowhere, and we've developed a research center that uh, is about 25 miles down a dirt road. And with that, we have to make our own power, our own electricity. We've got solar panels. We're trying to go into biomass power. We have a generator. We have to make our own water, which means we have to pump it from um, nowhere in the ground because we're in a very arid area. So our borehole is about um, 200 meters deep. But with that, we've developed a very sophisticated research center. I was trained to work out of the back of my truck, but I thought, you know, it would be a lot easier if I could have a few amenities. And so I developed a little veterinary clinic. And we have a genetics lab. And this is where we process our samples, and we study and learn more about the cheetah and many of the other uh, aspects of the overall health of the cheetah. Understanding the cheetah really revolves around trying to deal with large landscapes. And so as kind of Google mappers, I just think of your mapping program, you know, what does really a large landscape feel like, look like? For a cheetah, it Cheetahs cover areas of about 800 square miles. That's a couple males. A female might cover a larger area than that with their cubs. That's huge. And they live in very low density over very, very large areas. So when I talk about what it looks like to save the cheetah, I'm not saying a farm. I'm talking about a continent. So here's one of the radio collars that we use. These are satellite collars, and they're really cool. So we um, program them and then put them on. They have a lifetime of about three years, but you program them. And then they have a drop off. And so as they drop off, you've collected all this information via satellite. Of course, we map it all out. We know where the cheetahs are. We primarily like to get data about every hour on the animal. And as we start learning more about it, we can change that to go maybe four or five times a day. And then it uploads in the beginning, if we're putting a cat out, daily. And then as we start learning more about the animal and it settles down, we then start going to like every um, week. So our information is very extensive. Each one of these collars is about $5,500. But they have a very long lifespan, and they're very important to us for the research that we do. Our ecology is very critical. Um, again, some of a, a kind of a complicated map here. But this is where what a cheetah's home range would look like over here. And each one of these little squares right here is about 10,000 acres. So again, in looking at what that looks like, that's about 20 farms, and that's a typical home range for um, a cheetah. They live in low densities. There is overlap, and they have avoidance that goes on through scat um, and, uh, and scent marking. And so we actually study the scent marking by putting up camera traps. And these are different areas where we put these traps. This is about a 300 um, square mile area. And we find about 12 cheetahs that live in those areas. And we conduct this study using camera traps. And Mati and Kemba is our chief ecologist up at the top, having one of our camera traps there. And it's allowed us to understand more about the um, distribution and the density of cheetahs. And we see about four to five cheetahs per 1,000 square kilometers. Again, in what their home range looks like, male cheetahs live together their whole life. Male cheetahs form what are called coalitions. They're brothers. They love each other. And then they will form a, a territory or a home range, which is about um, 400 square miles as they get smaller. Um, and then with that, females cover multiple male home ranges. This is different like than any of the other large carnivores or cats. Is usually it's the males covering multiple females. Well, cheetahs are a little bit different. Cheetahs have what's called mate choice, and so they'll find which male groups that they want to go uh, mate with. They also um, have a matriarchal society. So within the female's home range, her daughters would stay. She'd be in where her sisters are. And they're huge, and yet they do overlap, but there's a lot of sociability that goes on in these very large home ranges. The other thing that we do is when we 
we're able to collect um, so many cheetahs, but fortunately we've stopped the farmers from catching so many. We still want to know more about how cheetahs are living out there. So we've employed scat dogs or detection dogs. So all four of these people and dogs up here are ecologists. Stephanie is one of our handlers and trainers of the dogs, and all three of those dogs are trained to go find cheetah scat. You say, go find, and the dog goes off with a collar on it that also maps where it's going that we can download and figure out how far it takes for the cheetah to go tracking, and they have quite a good um, scent, sense of scent, and they find the scat, they sit, and then we come over and we can collect the scat, and then we can take it into our genetics lab. And we have a, uh, a very uh, lovely genetics lab. We are one of the few places um, in Africa outside of a couple of the major cities that actually has a genetics lab. And our gene sequencer was donated to us by Life Science Technologies, which is also a San Francisco um, Bay uh, company. And we're very proud to have our sequencer, which means that we can, uh, and these are two of our geneticists. Fabiano just finished his PhD a few months ago, and Anne is our chief geneticist that runs our laboratory. We bring in a lot of Namibian and international students, a lot from throughout Africa that want to come in and learn about genetics. But our Namibian students as well are trying to learn much more because we really do need to train our next generation of Africans into being very good scientists as well. And that's something that we haven't done a lot with for the years. But as we take the SCAD in and overlap it with our camera traps, we can understand a little bit more about those individual cheetahs, understand their genealogy, their, their lineages through the scat. And this picture here shows the differences. So this picture is three, and there's another um, different cheetah up there. And this is one of the master's projects, one of our master's students from Namibia who's actually looking at identifying and comparing the different pictures with that of our scat that we're collecting. And it's a, it's a very important part of understanding the overall ranges of the cheetahs. We use dogs in another way, too. So we try to find the best use of many of our friends. But since Africa is full of ranchers or farmers, livestock farmers is what we call them, they all have livestock. And if the livestock gets caught by predators, then the predators are killed. So about 15 years ago, we started bringing in, uh, we brought in a breeding group of Anatolian Shepherd and Kangal dogs, which is a very large breed of dog. And we now breed the dogs, and we donate them to the farmers. The puppies are actually placed when they are about 10 weeks of age, and we then follow the puppies, working with the farmers to train the farmers in how the dogs are working. The dogs have been used for about 5,000 years through Turkey, and um, they're an amazing breed of dog. They bark loudly, they act as a guardian and not a herder, and they protect the flocks primarily through um, actually just being there. And, and the predators don't want to get hurt, they don't want to come in, and listening to this large dog bark, the, the predators know that there's something there that's actually protecting them. And it was exciting, on Sunday we just had a litter of 10 puppies born, so it was a fun day for my staff over in Namibia. It was my favorite dog, so I'm sorry to have missed her birthing. But when I get back in about a month, um, the puppies will be um, still another month to go before we actually will be placing them. So we placed nearly 500 of the dogs. And as we place them, they don't get to just get played with by the kids. But this often helps the kids that then can go off to schools. Because throughout Africa, most of the time, the children are the ones that are hurting the family's livestock. And again, this is one of my next questions is, if you were that age or your children are that age, would you want them out protecting your livestock? And what happens when the leopard comes? What, and most of the kids say, do you want to be out there? And the kids go, no, where would you go? We'd run back home. 
So then what would happen to your livestock? The leopard would probably eat it or the cheetah. So by having the dogs out there, the dogs grow up and become guardians. The kids can go to school. The livestock's not killed and the system then can work. So those are the kinds of things that we work on training in programs that we call Future Farmers of Africa. Africa is also a place where we all meet, eat lots of meat because meat's about the only thing there is to eat. Now when you live in an arid environment and there's not very much water and most of the rural people carry their water miles on their donkeys or on their own backs to try to get their water to the, their villages. And therefore, you can't really grow anything. And that's why people eat so much meat. And that's why we have so much goat and cattle. And that's why our landscape is overgrazed. With that, then, we started looking at the, the health of people and thought, well, you know, maybe if they learned that they had a couple of their goats, and maybe with those goats they could learn how to make cheese, and they could figure out how to go about doing this, even without electricity, that perhaps it could help them and their children have a better um, health. So we set up the dancing goat creamery. And the concept with the dancing goat is the fact that the goats can dance because they're protected by livestock guarding dogs, which are saving cheetahs. So there is a method to some of the madness that I have. These are my staff. Um, Chapa helps uh, manage our small stock. Shireen in the middle is our main cheese maker. Chapa has gone through University of Namibia as an agriculture major. Shireen is basically illiterate, and yet is the best cheese maker I think there is in the world. Um, Hanley helps me in all of our cooking aspects and manages the dairy. She's also a pastry chef. It's very good. Big pictures. So I want to talk about this big landscape and what it's going to take to actually have large landscapes. Our backyard, which is on the other side of the Waterberg National Park, which is this big mountain up there, which is a wildlife park owned by the government. And our land borders it. We have about 100,000 acres of land. We've got a very large piece of land that we manage as part of the Waterberg Conservancy. And it's a buffer to the wildlife park. Around us, then, is an area called the Greater Waterberg Landscape. We work with our neighbors in managing our wildlife and natural resources in an integrated system where we have enough grazing land, good wildlife, our livestock is protected, and then with that, predators can play a role in the system. We also not only have cheetahs in this area, we also have wild dogs, which are one of the most endangered of all the canids, or one of the most endangered predator there is in the world. So two iconic animals living in this landscape. Within this whole community is also um, a, a group of people which are called the Harero. The Harero speaking um, people are from Namibia. We've got about 12 different tribal people, but they have a very interesting culture. The women wear these um, amazing 25 yard uh, dress, um, colonially looking, and uh, the weather is about 120 degrees. So um, it's very um, interesting that they wear them, but they are very much a part of their culture. And the culture is that of being a cattle farmer. And yet there's no wildlife in this whole big circle here. So what our task has been with that of the Ministry of Environment and Tourism and the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, is to help change this area over into a landscape that's going to bring in wildlife, change, we hope, um, the, the lifestyles and the livelihoods from just a strictly um, livestock farming community and actually have a mixed wildlife livestock going into, for them, some ecotourism and allow an area for animals like cheetahs and wild dogs. So habitat is very, very important, as is prey. So you cannot have a cheetah or other predators without having prey. And without having enough grazing land, you can't have prey. And if people are hungry, they will eat all that prey, keep the grass for their cattle. And that's why this balance of this conservancy type initiative, which Namibia is very uh, famous for, is important. But a lot of our land is very, our uh, habitat is very overgrazed. And what happened with overgrazing, that means the cattle and the goats and sheep have taken down 
all the grasses, especially when we have a drought and there's not very much rain. And then what's happened is thorn bushes have taken over. So our wildlife is actually um, a changed. We end up seeing it move, and it goes into areas where there's more water and where there are grasslands. We have an area on our land which is called the Little Serengeti, and we're starting to see huge numbers of wildlife species starting to come back because of the kind of management that we've been dealing with within our conservancy. But this habitat has caused a major problem. And throughout an area, again, about the size of California, right in here, that area used to be an open grassland. And um, it's now what thickly thorn bush, called bush encroachment. And our thorns are, are horrible and long. And just imagine running through this or even walking through it. You can hardly penetrate it. And the bushes have taken over. They've got very, very deep roots that are drinking each plant about 65 liters of water per day. So it's a form of desertification. And with that, no grass grows. So we've taken an area about now, it, it's roughly about 26 million hectares of very, very thick thorn bush that you cannot even get through. And you can see this cow. She can't find her calf. With thickened thorn bush, farmers kill more cheetahs because they can't kill the bush, and every other predator has a problem. We've found an, uh, it's affected our economy by over 100 million US dollars per year by um, the farmers not being able to farm. And what we found is that cheetahs actually are scratching their eyes and going blind. And those animals then are the ones, that 3%, that might be out catching livestock. So we've actually took on a big problem, is to figure out how to go about dealing with this bush encroachment issue. So we started a habitat restoration program. Now it's been about 12 years ago. I think it was maybe six years ago, we won the uh, Tech Award for the environment uh, here in your area. And it was quite an honor that to be recognized here in this part of the world for the work that we're doing over in Africa. But we are um, selectively harvesting our bush. We're part of a Forest Stewardship Council certification uh, process. Can I ask how many of you might know what FSC is? Forest Stewardship Council certification. Hands, no hands, I see one head. It is the um, highest form of forest protection. And if we all knew what FSC was, we could not only, um, with every wood product that we were dealing with, as consumers, we could be helping a lot of different wildlife species, and um, including animals like elephants and orangutans. But for us, we're thinning the habitat so that we can have more grasslands. We're putting a lot of people to work. And from that, we made a little fuel log. And our little fuel log's coming around. It's an eco log, burns with very hot heat with a very low emission. But out of that, we're now looking at using biomass. Again, we've got an area the size of California that is, we get about 10 tons per hectare harvest that we could go into biomass electricity. Much of this biomass is being exasperated as well by the CO2 um, emissions that are going on because they're affecting the, uh, and allowing the, the, um, the trees to actually grow more, the bushes to grow up more. So these are what our fuel logs look like. And we ask people to think about eco-partnering and labeling and businesses and business partnering. And to look at um, products that might be well um, labeled or certified. We started a program called Wildlife uh, friendly, and we did this in cooperation with several other um, wildlife conservation groups that were working with communities that were putting people into work that were helping save endangered species. So our certified wildlife friendly is different than organic because for animals like predators, organic doesn't mean that you can't um, use strychnine and kill all the predators while you're having organic lamb. So those are things just to think on. Poaching is a big problem. I'd just like to touch basically on this for a minute, that the illegal trade is going from the northern parts of Africa, and they're coming into areas like Botswana, South Africa, and Namibia, taking small cubs, and um, in primarily, though, from Somaliland, which is pretty lawless up there, um, and um, southeastern Ethiopia, northern Kenya, 
and these cats are going up into the Middle East. And for every one cheetah that might make it there alive, we probably lose about five or more. So the cheetah cubs are captured and sold for a very low amount of money and then usually die. So they die usually under about three months of age uh, from diseases or improper diet. If they make it to two years of age, they're very lucky. Most of them don't. They die at that time, and then the cubs are gone. They go back into the illegal trade, get more of them from the wild, and are sold. So we're spending a lot of our time up in the Middle East at this point trying to work with um, the sheikhs. There are some very, very good sheikhs who are trying to actually um, help promote uh, the betterment of uh, the care of these animals. Just a couple months ago, we were up in um, UAE, and actually a lot of our work also deals with banking, biobanking of um, blood, sperm, tissues. And we trained over 35 of the veterinarians and uh, at several of the different facilities on how to bank down the sperm of their very rare cheetahs. Many of these animals, and these are at legitimate facilities, to try to actually help them more about the overall health of the animals and train the veterinarians. Putting cheetahs into the wild is, for us, the most important thing. And we have put uh, back into the wild over 600 cheetahs. We recently are doing a lot in reintroduction work. There's places like India that wants cheetahs again, Uzbekistan. And we're working with those countries to try to find ways that the cheetah could possibly go back out into some of these other ranges. We're keeping them living free and in the wild in Namibia, working in cooperation with other cheetah uh, programs throughout the cheetah's ranges, from cheetah conservation Botswana to um, cheetahs um, in Kenya, cheetah conservation in Kenya, or ACT. But getting cheetahs in the wild and keeping them there is all about all these components that I talked about. This is a special friend of mine, and he has passed away now a couple years ago. His name was Chewbacca, and he was with me for 16 years. He came in as an orphan. And um, his mother had um, been, unfortunately, well, he'd been taken from his mom and was almost on death door when I got him. He was one of my best friends and taught me a lot. But he also taught people throughout Namibia and throughout Africa about what a cheetah is. And when a farmer would come and yell at me about his problems with cheetahs, and Chewbacca would lick his hand and purr to him and look in his eyes, um, I won that farmer, and my job was then to work with him to find ways that he could live in harmony with the cheetah. I don't know how come I ended up being um, a cheetah voice, but I've been doing this for 40 years. It is the most amazing animal that I know. All animals are very special. And yet it, to me, tells me the job that we have to do in spreading the word. And I thank all of you for coming and listening to these things that we have to say about the cheetah, because it's all about thinking outside of square boxes. We welcome people to visit us at CCF. We take interns and volunteers. Any one of you can come. We're always looking for more capacity in our clinic, um, in our uh, genetics lab, working with us on Google Maps, in all the different aspects that we do work on. And we get people from around the world that do come and work with us. We've got, if you just want to come and visit, we've got a very nice guest house, which is three bedroom. It's called the Babson House, and we welcome guests as well. Um, but we are an open to the public research center. So when you're there at our Babson House, you're right in the heart and soul of the work that goes on with us. So I ask everyone to help, and all of you can help us as well, um, and by just spreading the word and helping keep cheetahs living in the wild. And support the work. Please spread the word. Please help buy the book that's out here. and um, Share it with others, because it is, um, uh, it's a special book. It's called uh, Future for Cheetahs. Because saving the cheetah really means changing the world. As I mentioned before, you all have changed the world. And I know that today, um, you could help me change the world to save more cheetahs as well. Thank you. We're going to bring in um, Bob and Rob. And we've uh, worked together for 20 years, I bet, huh? And they have a, re a, a cheetah education. They have an education center up in Occidental, Occidental <laughs> where they bring their cheetahs to schools. And they have other cats as well. Barb's been a teacher for more, more than 20 years. <laughs> 
and uh, went into helping us spread the word to help save our wildlife species. So Temba is going to come in, and he is four years old next month. Next month. And he is, was born in South Africa at the DeVilt Cheetah Center. And cheetahs don't breed very well in captivity. DeVilt's one of the only places in the world that's actually done so well. There's only a handful of breeding centers in the world. And he was hand-raised. He's multiple, he's fourth generation, I think, third generation, um, captive born. And being hand-raised, he's been able to be an ambassador by coming here to meet all of you today. And I'll just answer, and so we'll just, you guys get to meet the cheetah and a ask questions, so. You mentioned thinking about uh, reintroducing the cheetah to Uzbekistan, I think you said. What is their natural or historical northern limit of their They range? were found in Uzbekistan. They were in China. So they had a very, um, very big range throughout all of Asia and Africa. And so they went extinct around the Uzbekistan um, Russian territories in the 80s. And so that is one of the areas that they were living in. They've got vast grasslands, also very overgrazed. Uh, they're bringing back their wildlife population, and the government's got quite a commitment to this. It'll be years to do. Uh, we hope that we can have enough to put back when that time comes. Hi, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, since you're doing genetic work, the cheetahs that are, have been taken into um, other parts of the world as pets. Are you able to identify where they came from originally based on your genetic research? That's number one. Okay. <laughs> and then number two is, I know that you were saying that there was a bottleneck, um, was it 10,000 years ago? Yes, 1012. 1012, yeah, and they were down to like 2,000 or something. Ooh, Jeez, we or... don't even know. Yeah, okay, okay, I don't know. But um, I heard that number <laughs> Ask somewhere. Ask my PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> and so how different, how genetically different are the ones that are found in different parts of the, the world, that are part, you know, different parts of Africa, are they genetically somewhat different or are they still pretty much the same? They're very pretty much the same. So the divergence actually occurs over like 100,000 years. And these look like they maybe diverge much less than that. So there is some division in what they, in they look, you, know, you can tell one from one part of the world to the other, or Africa. But they are very, very, very much the same. And we are trying to um, help collect that genetic material. That's why we've gone up into the Middle East, and we're trying to collect everything that we can from these animals. So he's going to walk back and forth. What Rob has done is he's putting his meatballs down, and he's going to look at where those are. Now, if you notice those tear marks that run down from those eyes, the cheetah's spots are different than all the other spots. Most everyone sees spots, and they are leopards, usually. The cheetah's got polka dots. All leopards have are what are called rosettas, which is a circle with a, um, a black circle with yellow in the middle. But those tear marks are what dif distinguish a cheetah from any of the other spotted cats. You can hear his claws on the ground. Cheetahs are the only big cat that has non-retractable claws, or they're called semi-non-retractable. And their claws are used like cleats for traction and running. And that's one of the adaptations that's helped them run speeds of up to 70 miles an hour. When they run, their shoulder girdles and hip girdles are not connected, they're, and they, they allows them to have an amazing extension. And then they've got a very flexible backbone. And their tail is very long, and their tail is used as a rudder for balance to help them um, not roll over and spin out at that speed of 70 miles an hour. Now, a lot of people think that running 70 miles an hour is just what they do, but they really are more very acrobatic. So when they run, they're going from um, side to side, backwards to forwards, and so their tail plays an important role, as does the body build. Um, he's purring right now. I can hear him. Um, cheetahs are the only big cat that does purr. And they chirp like birds. They bubble, hiss, spat, growl, go, ow, ow, ow. Let me see. Who else might have a question out there? As I said, he's four, and he'll, she does have a lifespan in captivity of about um, 12 to 14. And in the wild, it's about uh, 8 to 10. You're OK. Um, 
you see them with the handler and you see them sitting next to you, but they are wild animals, so, and you're not supposed to go kitty kitty, so how tame are they really? Well, these guys have been hand raised. So he was hand raised on a bottle. The cheetah that I was with was hand raised from the time he was 10 days old. And they are an animal that can be tamed. And that's why um, cheetahs are still one of the few animals that can be used in educational purposes by legitimate facilities. Now, they're registered. And so there's only a handful of facilities in the world that have cheetahs, number one. And we've been trying to get that under control so that they are registered facilities by USDA here in the United States. And the, um, by, by California Fish and Game, by the US Department of um, yeah. Fish and Wildlife. I have many, many, many licenses. Yes. <laughs> and so, and they're used for education. So it stops people from just having them as a pet. Here in California, it is illegal to own any wild animal as a pet. Some of the states, it is still legal. Um, the laws are changing dramatically, um, just so people don't have a tiger as a pet. Um, but um, in California, you can't. So um, these are strictly educational outreach ambassadors. They are not our pets. OK, I've got three questions here. Is one right here. Is two. Yeah, I was wondering with the, the limited genetic uh, it, uh, cheetahs have. Have you tried um, transferring cheetahs from one of the isolated islands of populations to the others to sort of increase the diversity? Well, we um, have not done that yet because there's a lot of um, international laws that would prohibit that. Because the governments, you know, like in Iran, their cheetah is special and they don't want to mix it with anything even though it might save them in the long run. But we're hoping that intervention through habitat, education, uh, policies and politics will actually help us try to grow the populations. And we've, we've, you know, the work that we've done in 25 years in Namibia has set a stage and a model for cheetah conservation throughout Africa. Uh, another, yes? Um, yeah. Thank you for coming. It's uh, very um, um, inspiring. And uh, I wonder, like, uh, how, how, do you, how do you plan to scale up your solution? And uh, what are the major bottlenecks that you see. Thank you. I love your question. Scaling up is what my life is all about. Uh, when I first said I needed to go save the world, people wondered what I was talking about. So our programs run like Future Farmers of Africa. So we're trying to partner with other organizations that are involved like places like CARE and other um, humanitarian organizations who are not putting wildlife and um, grazing lands into the landscape promoting programs like our um, um, conservancies are very important. Organizations like World Wildlife Fund are very committed to those kinds of big picture thinking. So as a small organization, what we're trying to do is to get enough funds to actually scale up. From our bush harvesting program, we actually are looking for uh, funding to actually scale it up into biomass power. We're trying to get power on our land to start with and then show Namibia that we can power it through our bush harvest. So there's, and then other places of Africa are looking at the same kinds of issues in wanting to have something to do with their, their habitat. Habitat restoration is gonna be key. And then looking at livelihood development, getting people out of that cycle of being poor, starving farmers. I'd love you to help. <laughs> You know, the children ask me all the time, you know, how can we living in America really help cheetahs living in Africa? And as with most things, it boils down to money. And um, if you have, you know, um, any kind of donation you can make, Lori puts to amazing use. It goes directly to saving cheetahs in the wild. So. <laughs> So I, you know, I know a lot from watching TV about how, how and why dogs fit into human families. I don't really understand the social, you know, what, how do you, how does a hand raised cheetah see the people around it? Like, what does that social structure look like in a in a cheetah world? Do you know what I mean? Well, like right here, or just in general, what do they, what is their social interaction with other cheetahs, and how do they translate that to humans? Is this like an orphan cheetah, like at our place, or? No, and cheetahs in general, right? I mean, I think dogs socialize well with people because oh, they the socialize wild. well in, with Cheetahs are, much, are very much more social than what we would think. 
And that sociability in the wild is the fact that females are covering large areas with their cubs. And so they start with a small area and grow out and out and out, covering a lot of areas. They go to these marking trees, these play trees. They know the scents and smells of the other animals. So the female is a very important um, teacher in how to live out in the wild. Males will kind of do avoidance through, again, scat and scent. They might use the same play tree or marking area. You never know where those meatballs are going to show up. <laughs> Male cheetahs live, um, as I said, in coalitions. And a female's got her cubs for about uh, nearly two years, 18 to 22 months. Uh, at that, they and the cubs stay together until they separate. Males separate from the females, and the females have litters. So it's a very interesting social life. So these guys run 50, 60 miles an hour. Um, question, just very practical. When you want to take him for a run, <laughs> do you take him on the 101, the I-5? <laughs> How does that work? We have 22 acres of land, and we have 22 acres of land, and what we use is a lure system that was designed for um, coursing greyhound dogs. So basically, twice, at least twice a week, we do run our cheetahs to the lure, so they do get lots of exercise. They're exercising that big heart those lungs, um, the muscles that they really need to um, be healthy. It, exercise is very, very important for them. Yes, more. OK. A few years ago, I, I uh, went with my wife to Africa, and we, uh, Tanzania, actually, uh, just looking at all the wildlife. And it was amazing. I, I was there mostly for the cheetahs, actually, and yes. I, I, I was impressed that they seem kind of lazy. I kept wanting to see them running after stuff. Several times we saw them hunting, but they'd sort of gallop, they'd like, like trotting, and they'd just give up. Is that um, what, do they not actually do the full-out sprints very often? Maybe we just saw them when they weren't hungry? I don't... Maybe, but they will only exert themselves um, when they know they have a good chance. So if they're trotting after it, they're kind of assessing the situation. Oftentimes they trot, they stalk. A hunt could take you know, several hours. So, yeah. And then when they do, it's, it's a burst of speed that you can hardly even catch it. It's like, wow, I just was looking at him laying down here. And you know, look at that dust. You know, how, how did I miss that? So it is, it's amazing. But like all cats, they are energy stores. So they will sleep. Um, and then hunt as they need. Cheetahs are actually, um, will hunt more regularly than all the other cats. They like fresh food, uh, so they're hunting on a regular basis. Female with cubs is on, she's on the move all the time. Female cheetahs are the best. Male cheetahs are the best. Uh-oh, I think I'm conflicted here. <laughs> And in your, in your place, do you have problems with the lions and the hyenas? Where we are, because we're on, on rural farmland, and that's why the cheetah is taken on into this area, is that farmers have killed all the lions and hyenas. We have leopards. We have uh, baboons. Both of those are one of the key um, problems for the cheetah. But we've been studying how the cheetah overlaps with the leopard as well. And we've ended up living with baboons these days, too. So it's rather interesting how the, the cycles work. How much do the cheetahs eat? In the wild, they will eat, um, well, in captivity, let us say that they might eat four or five pounds a day, an animal this size. In the wild, then it would be um, they would eat as much as they could, as quickly as they could. So it might be eight to 10 kgs, which is maybe um, 16, 20 pounds, just fast. And then they're gorged, and they might not eat. If they get to eat that big of a diet, they might not eat for a couple days. A female, if she's feeding her cubs, depending on the size of those cubs, she is um, hunting and watching. Her cubs are eating fast, and she's going to get some morsels in it. Unlike lions, lions will actually eat first, and the cubs eat last. A female cheetah will make a kill and make sure her cubs eat first. So it's a, it's a lot of food that they do consume on a regular basis. Lean meat. 
So, of course, their antelope that they're eating is also very lean. Um, you, you just said that uh, there's a difference on how much they eat um, in captivity versus the wild. Does that uh, hurt their chances of reintroduction if they're not used to, uh, you know, gorging themselves when the food is available as opposed to regular feedings? Um, no, because uh, you have to keep them on a regular diet, and you can start with, if you go to a reintroduction, and it's usually not cat, well, if they're orphaned animals, they, you would start putting them on carcasses. So they start learning how to eat carcasses, and then they, you know, fill up and go skinny. And it's fun. I had a question about the uh, Uzbekistan cheetahs. Were those more genetically similar to the Iranian cheetahs or to the African cheetahs, or what are, what are the issues there? Or well, we don't know because they're extinct. Um, we are trying to find out much more about the, um, some of these extinct populations by collecting like, um, samples from the museums. So they would, they're all so similar that it's hard to actually see that much differentiation with them. But it would be an animal that would probably be much more similar to that of the um, Iranian cheetah. The Asian cheetah. It, you mentioned there are about 10,000 in the wild right now. I'm wondering what a healthy and sustainable population would be, or if you have a target number in mind for that. I kind of like 100,000. You know, if you got, that's not that many necessarily in throughout the continent. It, then it, if you kind of look at, I do a lot of math and I do a lot of modeling and have to then look at if you need, and I know so much, so I'm always figuring out how much land they need, how much prey they'd need, how much grasslands they'd need, um, how many cattle are out there, how many people are out there. How do we actually switch that back into these grasslands where we've got wildlife and prey the people are actually getting a different livelihood than being poor, starving farmers. Um, and all of a sudden, the people are doing something different. And yet, the wildlife is still maintaining these grassland systems where you then have elephants and rhinos in the land. And then, you know, we're looking at this kind of big support system for a big continent. And the wildlife are a support system, it's a part of biodiversity. I'd be real happy if we could you know, double the population in the next, you know, five years or 10 years. We've doubled the population in Namibia in 20 years, and we're kind of stabilizing it. But with that, we now need to, I guess, and we are working with the other countries throughout the cheetah's range in order to help stabilize those and grow those populations. But it's, it's all about people. And so I just keep trying to figure out ways of helping people and wanting them all to love the cheetah. I mean, wasn't he beautiful? He's, I know it's not, it, 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 I bet you haven't had a cheetah at Google before. <laughs> so, and on Earth Day, and you know, it's a, a celebration of Earth Day, 44 years. And um, thank you, you all can do an awful lot to just spread the word and get more people involved in, in many ways. And I'm always happy to answer more questions. And welcome all of you to come down and visit. Oh, I could, I'm happy to sign books as well. Buy books, spread books. <laughs> you can also adopt cheetahs online or adopt a dog at our website. We've got a really nice website, so please go to it, cheetah.org. If you have kids in school here and you want to have the Diceleys come and bring one of their educational programs, they're just amazing. And they help support many of us who have um, cat conservation programs worldwide. But I live in an area where Namibia's got like 2.2 million people, and uh, that's not very many in a very large country. However, um, that's why we got lots of thorn bushes. Getting to know people when I come over here from Africa is really nice, and I hope that you'll all become part of our family and let us know who you are and um, learn ways that you can actually get involved in uh, making the world different and better with cheetahs. So, thank you. <laughs>